Most people, it's not hard for them to get fired up about something for a few days. It's once you get to like week two that most people tap out. I think people underestimate how influenced we are by our surroundings and our environment. And I think some of those early changes sustainable, you have to do a lot of interventions within your environment, whether that is throwing all the junk food out of your fridge, making it easier to get out of bed in the morning, putting the alarm clock on the other side of the room, or surrounding yourself with the, the right people that will make it easier to implement the desired change. Right? Like if you are receiving social validation from people for bad behaviors, then one of the most effective things you can do is surround yourself with people who are going to validate you for better behaviors. Like one thing I've been saying a lot that's been resonating with people is that, you know, there's all this talk about like, I wish I didn't care what people think or I wish I didn't validation from others, but that's impossible. Like we're social creatures. We're always going to need validation. Instead of trying to not be validated by others, we should be validated by better people and for better reasons. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 of Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because in my first business, I struggled to stay afloat. I quit on my business partner, and the thing that kept me motivated, that kept me going, was studying the stories of famous, successful entrepreneurs. And in their stories, it gave me the hope, the drive, the ambition, the thinking that maybe I can do it too, that extra bit of belief. And I still need their stories today and I'm honored to share them with you here as well. So today let's learn from one of the best, Mark Manson, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. So if the validation that you find yourself seeking from others is hurting you, then you need to find people that that social validation is gonna help you. You know, and the most, banal cliche examples like joining a gym, right? Like join, join, go join a CrossFit class or something. It's like what CrossFit has done that is so genius is that they have found a way to leverage social validation into exercise. So it's like people who have hated exercise their entire life, suddenly they're in an environment where a bunch of really nice, encouraging people are rewarding them for doing hard things. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably at like the base level, like the most fundamental way to kind of rewire what you care about or what you want in your life is to align yourself with social groups that are gonna reward you for wanting those things. Rule number two is make better decisions. Utilize some tools to help you become more rational, to help you externalize your thought process so that you can remove those emotional forces that are putting their finger on the scale. The easiest way to do that is to write stuff down. There's something about writing your thoughts down that forces you to look at them as if they're not your own. So anytime in my life when I have a major decision to make, I just start writing about it. I start writing about my, my thought process. I start explaining all the evidence, all the reasons why I wanna make this decision. And sure enough, pretty much every single time, I find that I'm overestimating things. I find I'm underestimating things. Another way to do this, obviously, is to find an advisor or a mentor or somebody you look up to, maybe even just a friend who isn't afraid to tell you you're an idiot if you need to hear it. Talk to them through your thought process and then actively ask them to challenge you on it. And then the last strategy is something a little bit less scientific, but also something I feel pretty strongly about. That is optimize your decisions for zero regrets. Ultimately, a lot of things are impossible to know if they're a good thing or not. But if you ask yourself, will I regret doing it or will I regret not doing it? That can often give you your answer. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to move to New York City. It was a daunting choice. I'd been living abroad for seven years. I had just gotten engaged. I wasn't sure if I wanted to live in the United States anymore. New York is really expensive. I wasn't sure if I could afford it. I asked myself, 20 years from now, if I don't do this, will I regret it? And the answer was, yeah. I think I would always wonder what it would have been like to live in New York City. Then I asked myself, if I moved to New York, do I think I would regret it in 20 years? And the answer is no, because if it sucks, you just leave again. Therefore, it became clear that moving to New York was the choice of minimal regret. And that's a tool that I've used in many of my major life decisions. I've simply asked myself, will I regret doing this or will I regret not doing it? And 90% of the time, I would regret not doing it. So I just do it. Even if you make great decisions, you don't know that they're great decisions. In the moment, every great decision still feels really tenuous and scary. 
you're full of doubt. You don't know if it's gonna work out or not. I think there's this idea that the right decision, it pops up and you're like, oh my God, it's like the clouds part. And it's like, this is the answer to everything. That never happens. Good decisions, especially the best decisions, the reason they're the best decisions is because it's so difficult to see what the correct move is. So in that sense, the best decision should be scary. It should feel uncomfortable. It should push your boundaries a little bit because that's part of what makes it the best decision. It's a signal of the significance of the moment. So don't look for decisions that feel comfortable and feel easy. Look for the decisions that inspire the doubt, that inspire the insecurity, because that's where the real shit is. Rule number three is stop trying to be perfect. Is striving for perfection self-defeating? Whenever I commit to doing something that would benefit me in my life, be it eliminating bad habits, a change in diet, working out, I always put a lot of pressure on myself to be doing things right without fail. I can't miss my workout today, no matter what. I have to eat only specific types of food every single day and not go over my calorie limit. I need to wake up at 5.30 a.m. without fail. These are just some examples of what goes on in my head, but it goes for everything I set my sights on. This need to do things right and not skip new habits takes a lot out of me. It takes a lot of discipline and willpower to stick with it. And ultimately, I end up failing to meet my own standards, which results in me feeling bad and reverting back to old habits. Look, the short answer is these are just made up standards in your head. These are just these, these obscene, absurd, silly metrics that you're creating for yourself and you're deciding like, oh my God, I woke up at 5.35, I'm a loser, I'm a loser. And, and it's, it's not real, dude. Look, I, I think we can all agree that the, the problem here is not the goals. These are nice goals to have. In fact, a lot of us have these goals. The problem is that you have this all or nothing attitude about it. That like, if, if I don't wake up at 5.30 in the morning for the rest of my life, I failed and I might as well just give up. That's ridiculous. Imagine if you applied that same mentality to other things in your life. Like imagine you were driving somewhere and you got lost or you took a wrong turn and you're like, oh, I guess I should go home now. Or imagine you're having a conversation with, with a good friend and, and you, something, you, you say a word wrong, something comes out wrong and you're like, oh, I guess I should just shut the up for the rest of my life. It doesn't make any sense. This is a, a, a strange prison you are inflicting on yourself. And I would argue that you're using this all or nothing mentality as a way to avoid the responsibility of actually dealing with your failures. See, it's easy to screw up one day and, and f up some of your goals and say, you know what, I wasn't trying in the first place. Yeah, that was, I give up. That's the easy way out, that's the bullshit way out. It's much, much harder to wake up an hour late one day and be like, I didn't mean to do that, but it's all right. We're going to take care of it tomorrow. We're going to do it again. That's the hard way out. So that's the first thing I would tell you. The second thing I'm going to tell you is that perfection is imperfect. It's funny you use these examples because if you actually look at the research on diet and nutrition, they actually find that breaking a strict diet produces better results than adhering to a strict diet religiously. The same thing is true for working out. If you go on bodybuilder forums or whatever, you will find every single workout plan that you come across, they build in rest periods. They build in periods for you to stay home and sleep and let your body recuperate. There's no such thing as working out every day for the rest of your life. That's just insanity. And here's another turd I'm gonna leave in your soup bucket. You don't get to decide how much sleep your body needs. Sometimes your body needs more sleep and it has nothing to do with you, man. It has nothing to do with you. It's not because you're lazy, it's not because you fucked up. Sometimes you're stressed out or your girlfriend gets mad at you and you're just exhausted and your body needs that extra hour. And the fact that you're not letting your body have that extra hour because you've got this bizarre idea of productivity that you're trying to adhere to, it, you're actually hurting yourself. You're making yourself less productive. You're robbing yourself of energy and vitality and life. Rule number four is ground yourself. What are the things that you found are good to ground yourself in? Or where do you continue to take your sense of pride, integrity, personal self-worth mm -hmm. from uh, that isn't the rapidly changing ascending numbers and, and revenue and stuff like that? Well, I, I think the most important thing, and at least the most important thing for me, is just been having a really solid group of people in your life. Um, 
And that's the other thing. That's one of the other things that changes with success. Sometimes people around you start behaving differently or treating you differently and uh, both in a positive way and in a negative way. And that that's super weird to, to deal with. But, you know, ideally you have a, a critical mass number of people in your life that don't give a shit you know, how much money you make or how, how many people downloaded your last episode or whatever. Like they just want to hang out and drink a beer and watch football. Um, like, like they always did. And I, I found that incredibly, like I found myself craving that actually, you know, I would go do a speaking tour, um, go hang out with Will Smith, meet a bunch of crazy celebrities that I always wanted to meet. And then, you know, make a bunch of money and I would come home and I'd be like, God, I just want to like see my old friends and talk about totally unimportant stuff and just goof around for, for a week. Like that, that seems very nourishing, uh, at, at those moments. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is choose quality over quantity. I think you said happiness is most tied to their relationships. Yeah. How do we do relationships well? Is it a bunch of people? Are there certain, like, you need romance, you need just, friendship, whatever? Just just more easy questions, I see. I like the softballs. <laughs> I like softballs, Mark. Come on. Um, I definitely don't think the answer is quantity. And I think that, well, I mean, actually, we have a lot of research showing that the answer to, to the relationship question is not quantity. Like, in mm -hmm. fact, it seems that there's a thing called the Dunbar number, which shows that you know we actually seem we struggle quite a bit to empathize beyond a certain amount of people. And in terms of close friendships, we seem to max out around five or six. Mm. Um, so it's definitely quality over quantity. And and I think not only is it quality over quantity, but quantity can actually distract from quality. Uh, I just moved here from New York. We were talking about that earlier. One of the, the constant struggles in New York City is that there's always so much going on and there's so many people that you can meet and hang out with that nobody actually ends up being satisfied with their social lives. Mm -hmm. Like It ends up being this kind of constant churn of friends and acquaintances and you might meet somebody and you really like them and you're like, man, we should hang out, we should get together. And eight months will go by before you see them again, just because your both of your schedules are so hectic and crazy and there's so much other stuff going on. So uh, I, I do think quantity distracts from the quality. Quality is what matters. And I think when, when you talk about quality, there's, there's a few things going on. One is there, there needs to be some sort of alignment in terms of values and worldview. So like you need to have something in common. You need to care about the same thing. Something doesn't need to be about doesn't need to be everything, but there need there needs to be something that you both believe that you both care about. This is true for friendships and romantic relationships. Um, there needs to be alignment somewhere on like a deep value. Rule number six is have a contrarian idea. Most people don't ever have a contrarian idea in their life. Let's be honest. Most people just kind of go with the flow and agree with whatever their friends tell them is cool that week. But there is a significant minority of people in society that will think for themselves and come up with some contrarian ideas or buy into some bad crazy theories. Which brings us to number two. Of all the people that have contrarian ideas, the vast majority of those contrarian ideas are not going to be correct. They're going to be horribly wrong. They're going to be embarrassingly wrong. This is actually the most difficult part of achieving insane amounts of success. You have to disagree with everybody and then be right. 
And even if you happen to disagree with everybody and be right about it, you have to be willing to execute. You have to put your ass on the line. Now, when we look at super successful people, we tend to focus on that last part. What's his morning routine? What sort of supplements did she take? Execution gets discussed most of the time because it's easy to observe. It's also easy to replicate. So while execution is incredibly important, it is not the thing that determines the magnitude of a person's success. Steve Jobs was not Steve Jobs because he woke up early and ate an ass load of fruit. Steve Jobs was Steve Jobs because he believed a full decade before anybody else that one day a computer would sit on every desk and be in every office in the entire world. And he was correct about it. Warren Buffett, every morning, goes to the McDonald's drive-thru and gets the same piece of breakfast that you and I look down on. How is he not dead yet? Warren Buffett is Warren Buffett because consistently he has identified companies that were extremely valuable that most other people thought sucked. And then he bought them. And then he sat around eating McDonald's and drinking Coca-Cola and waited a few decades, which by the way is another thing most people are not willing to do. And now he's the greatest investor of all time. Execution is overrated. If I can do one thing that will 100x my results, then the other 99 things don't really matter. But people don't like hearing this because it is unbelievably hard to find that one thing that is gonna 100x your results. They almost don't exist anywhere. So instead, we make videos about, you know, morning routines and to eat as if like eating the same meal that Kobe Bryant ate before basketball games is going to make you play basketball like Kobe Bryant. Rule number seven is learn to let go. For simple, mindless, repetitive tasks, effort and reward tend to have a linear relationship. The more time you spend in the car, the further you get. For complex, novel experiences that involve social relationships, creativity, new experiences, they tend to have a diminishing relationship between effort and reward. That is a diminishing curve. And then for emotional and psychological experiences that only exist inside our own minds, that is where the inverted curve kicks in. The more you pursue happiness, the further away from it you get. The more you try to feel confident, the more you question yourself and feel insecure. The more you wish to be loved, the more your neediness repels people around you. The constant desire to be free from constraints is itself a constraint. Aldous Huxley once wrote, the harder we try with the conscious will to do something, the less we shall succeed. Proficiency and results come only to those who have learned the paradoxical art of doing and not doing, or combining relaxation with activity. The most fundamental components of our psychology operate in this way. This is because when we consciously desire a particular state of mind, we inadvertently create the opposite state of mind. So it's by wanting to be happy that we remind ourselves that we are not happy. It's wanting to be confident that we remind ourselves we are not confident. It's by wanting to be loved that we remind ourselves that we don't feel love. The inverted curve at its core is the backwards law that I describe in chapter one of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a f Desiring a positive experience is itself a negative experience. And the acceptance of a negative experience is itself a positive experience. But this extends to most, if not all, of our mental health and relationships. Whether it's our desire to feel more happiness, confidence, control, satisfaction, security, novelty, all of these things, by wanting them, we simply move ourselves further away from them. It's by wanting to stay on the surface of our satisfaction that we only cause ourselves to plunge deep into the water. These internal psychological experiences exist on an inverted curve because they are both the cause and the effect of the same thing, the mind. When you desire happiness, your mind is both the thing that desires and the thing that is desired. When it comes to these lofty abstract goals, our mind is like a dog that after successfully chasing and catching all sorts of other things in its life has decided to turn on its own tail and try to catch its tail. I mean, why not? Chasing things has worked for everything else in life. Why wouldn't it work for happiness or confidence or security? But a dog can never catch her own tail. The more she chases, the more the tail seems to run away. That's because the dog lacks the perspective to understand that she and the tail are the same thing. The goal is to take your mind 
a wonderful tool that has spent its life chasing many, many things, and teach it to stop chasing its own tail, to teach it to achieve what it desires by giving up what it desires, to show it that the only way to reach the surface is to let itself sink. And how do we do this? You do this by relinquishing control, not because you feel powerless, but because you are powerful, because you have decided to let go of things that are beyond your control. You decide to accept that sometimes people will not like you, but you engage with them anyway. That sometimes you will not feel confident, but you do the thing anyway. That sometimes you will not be happy, but you will get out of bed anyway. You decide to accept that most of the things you do in your life will result in failure. And not only is that okay, it's the only way to get back to the surface, to breathe, and to do it again. Rule number eight is grow from pain. Sometimes you need to suffer a certain amount to change and grow. And in fact, this is what Dabrowski concluded. After suffering all those years in Nazi prison camps and then later uh, in communist prison camps, and spending his life studying World War II survivors and Holocaust survivors, he came to a very profound conclusion. He realized that pain and suffering wasn't always damaging to people. In fact, he found that most survivors of the war, years later, would look back and credit the horrifying things that happened to them as part of what made them better people later. Dabrowski came up with a theory called positive disintegration which basically he saw human character as a kind of a chrysalis that in order for a beautiful butterfly to come out, you needed a certain amount of pressure and strain and pain on the person to free them to become who they really were. So whereas most Western developmental models looked at, at growth and potential as something as removing pain from one's life, Dabrowski went completely the other route. He said, you need a certain amount of pain and suffering in your life to bring the best out of you. Rule number nine is choose your struggles. You say that the most important question to ask yourself in life is what pain do you want in your life and what are you willing to struggle for? Why is that the right question to ask? Uh, I think it's the right question because anything worthwhile is going to require some, some degree of pain and struggle. And um, and so if you're, if you're oriented towards the pain and struggle, you're, you're probably going to be more aligned with what you're capable of accomplishing rather than if you just orient towards the pleasures. I also just think it's a much more interesting question, right? Like we all want the same stuff, more or less. We all want to be liked and make money and be popular and be good at something. Um, what, what I think differentiates us as individuals is, is what sacrifices we're willing to make and what challenges we actually enjoy. Um, I used to say like, I, you know, I meet a lot of people who tell me they want to, it's probably like, I'm sure there's a million people who tell you now that like they want to start a podcast. It's ever since my, my books blew up. It's like everybody I meet, it's like, Oh, I, I want to write a book. I've got this great idea. And then of course you ask them, have you started writing? And they're like, Oh no, 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 no. I, I need to like, you know, think about it a little bit more. And it's, I think at the end of the day, most people just don't enjoy sitting by themselves in a quiet room, writing and rewriting and rewriting the same paragraph like eight times. And I do for some reason. Like to me, that's a very enjoyable afternoon. And that's probably why I'm a writer and most people are not. So that is the pain that you want in your life, or at least it's the pain that you're willing to endure. Yeah. It's, or, it, you know, another way to frame it is kind of like, what, what is the pain that, what is the pain that feels easy to you, but seemingly nobody else? Like it, it never, I remember when I first started blogging. And I went to a couple, like the first couple, like kind of blogging or internet business events I went to, people would come up to me and they'd be like, man, how do you, how do you write such long blog posts? And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, I, I can't, I can't write like it's 500, 400, 500 words a day. And like, I I'm tapped out. And meanwhile, I'm writing like 3000, 4000, 500, 5000 word posts, um, every couple of days. And to me, it never even occurred to me that that was a lot. That was just kind of like what came out when I sat down the right. Um, so I think it's very useful to 
look for and discover the difficult things that that come easily to you and but don't come easily to most people because that's probably where your con- competitive advantage is and that's probably where you're you're most likely to succeed i'm going to pretend the last one before some very special bonus clips is quit alcohol Let's talk about the benefits of quitting alcohol and why you should quit too. First, there were the obvious benefits. I lost some weight, I slept like a baby, date nights with the wife got much, much cheaper, but there were some unexpected benefits as well that took me by a little bit of a surprise. Number one, less insecurity. I actually began to notice this when I cut back drinking only to a few times per month. The two to three days after I would drink, I would be more emotional the next couple days. I would get crankier, more excited, more embarrassed, but since quitting drinking entirely, I find that I am on an incredibly even keel. This has been an unexpected boon for my productivity and work. There's much less energy being spent on trying to manage my own emotions and much more energy being invested into creativity. Number two, more clarity around my values and priorities. Back when I used to drink a lot, I would get excited about three or four different project ideas in any given week. I'd feel anxiety and FOMO if I passed up opportunities. I would dedicate myself to a new idea only to start questioning that idea a few days later. I would ride this roller coaster of emotion, one day feeling like I was doing exactly what I was meant to be doing, and then the next having a complete existential crisis that I was wasting my time. Now I have a handful of goals that I know I want to accomplish and I focus on them. I say no to all conflicting opportunities and there's no drama, no bullshit. No more bullshit. Number three, fewer but better friends. In my 20s, I drank alcohol at social events to bury my anxiety. In my 30s, I drank to bury my boredom. The epiphany I had when I stopped drinking is that if I'm bored when hanging out with certain people, I should simply stop being friends with those people. For some reason, this thought never occurred to me in the 15 years that I was drinking, but now that I'm sober, it seems like the most obvious thing in the world. It goes without saying, if you need to drink to enjoy a person or a thing, you don't actually enjoy that person or thing, and you should stop doing both. Sober socializing is definitely a case of quality over quantity, and I like it that way. Number four, changed hobbies and interests. For years, I thought I was really passionate about food and fine dining. Turns out I just like getting drunk at restaurants. I thought I loved the theater and live shows. Turns out a lot of them aren't as entertaining when you're sober. I thought I liked certain events and networking groups and parties. Turns out Sober Mark would rather be home. Overall, from the outside, my life probably appears a lot more boring and dull, but strangely, I'm way more satisfied and happy. You are responsible for everything in your own experience, even if it's not your fault. This concept of radical responsibility, it comes from existentialism, Jean-Paul Sartre more specifically. Now Sartre had this amazing insight, which is that in every moment that we are conscious, we are choosing. We are constantly making choices, not only of what to do, but also of how to see things. You know, if somebody says something that pisses me off, Part of that is because I chose to see it in a way that pisses me off. I chose to have values that caused it to piss me off. I chose to to listen to the guy who pissed me off. Now Sartre said that this constant choosing, this, this necessity for choosing of perception and action in every single moment, it is a massive load on us mentally and emotionally. We are terrified of shouldering this constant responsibility. And so, as humans, what we tend to do is we find ways to give other people responsibility. To say, oh, well, it's not my fault, he made me do it. Or to say, yeah, it's my, my boss f***ed up. I was, just, I was just following rules. It's not my fault we defrauded a charity out of billions of dollars. He did it. You can probably relate to this. We all love to blame other people for our sh- That's normal, that's just human nature. But Sartre took this even further. He said that we often look to other people to adopt our values, to adopt our principles, to adopt our belief systems and what we care about. And this is a much more subtle shirking of responsibility. You know, it's saying like, my dad was a doctor and his dad was a doctor and his dad was a doctor, so of course I have to be a doctor. It's saying like, well, everybody else is doing it, so I should do it too. It's this very subtle form of avoiding responsibility that Sartre called living in bad faith. It's basically like living for other people. 
rather than for yourself. Now, on the flip side of bad faith, start called living with responsibility, making consciously making those choices based on your own principles and values in every single moment, and also being aware that you're making those choices in each, each and every moment. Sartre called this living in authenticity. Today, we think of it just generally as being yourself or finding who you are, finding out what you care about what your values are, what you're willing to stand for, and then be willing to make that choice when it comes, even if you're gonna be punished socially for it. Because you made it this far in a video, I wanna celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Tom Bill, you check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. When you start the day, if you get early momentum going, the rest of the day is often gonna follow in that. It's an idea called entropy. Everything moves towards chaos. And the only way to combat that is to put energy into the system.